Hello and welcome to the Inside Intelligence webinar series brought to you by the Master of Science in Intelligence Analysis Program and the Johns Hopkins University Office of Advanced Academic Programs. Today's event features a discussion on learning how to maximize your chances to obtain a security clearance. My name is Peter Huggins and I'm the event producer. Please note today's event will be recorded and uploaded to the AAP YouTube channel under the Inside Intelligence playlist. During the program, if you have any questions, please feel free to use the Q&A function, and we'll answer as many questions as possible during the latter portion of the event. With that, I will turn over the event to our speaker, Mark Zaid. Excellent. Thank you so much, and appreciate everybody being here. So we are going to spend the next hour or so uh, going through how best to maximize your chances to get a security clearance. Uh, with the United States government and have access or at least eligibility for access to classified information or what we also call national defense information under the Espionage Act. Uh, we are particularly going to spend our time going through a document called the SF-86, which probably you've all heard of. And I'm going to put an active link. I'm going to put it on the screen in just a little bit. But just so that you have uh, an active link to this document, uh, sometimes it is called an equip for the electronic version. There is a revised version that is now being called an e-app. Uh, I'm not particularly fond of it so far. Uh, I'm not quite sure where it came from, uh, nor is a lot of people in the U.S. government from what I've been hearing. Uh, but it is a shorter version of the SF-86. You will see a cat make an appearance throughout the lecture uh, it is a shorter version of the SF-86, which can be, depending on which version you're looking at, 132 pages. Although a lot of those pages are duplicative uh, as you fill out, uh, assuming you're going to have many places where you lived, many places where you worked. Uh, so there's a lot of extra pages or relatives, etc. cetera. Uh, this, the premise for access as I find this link, uh, originates out of Executive Order 12968, which President Clinton issued back in 1995. So that's a document at some point in time you should look at. And a separate class that I would often do on the due process component of security clearance pertains to the security clearance adjudicative guidelines which are contained within what we call SEED-4, Security Executive Agent Directive 4, that was issued in 2017 uh, during the Obama administration. And that governs due process. It is very much related to a lot of what we do in the SF-86. What I am trying to help you with as you fill out this form is minimize any potential disqualifying factors, or more appropriately, mitigate any potentially disqualifying factors. You will see if you look at one day the executive, uh, the uh, security clearance adjudicative guidelines. It will there are thirteen of them, and it discusses from A to M what the concern is, what the potential disqualifying factors are, and then what are the potential mitigating factors. So guideline C, uh, foreign uh, concern, having to do with foreign uh, concerns, passports, foreign passport, um, that's a potentially disqualifying factor. Uh, a mitigating factor would be you tell the government you have a foreign passport and you don't use it. Uh, so a lot of things like that. When you fill out this SF-86, which is the opening form in this process, you obviously, you first get hired generally by the agency, whichever agency it is, or you are sponsored by a defense contractor or even could be an academic institution uh, that has the need for clearances. I, I deal with Hopkins all the time for their advanced propulsion uh, entities up north of Baltimore uh, for folks that have clearances through the lab. Uh, you do have to be a U.S. citizen. There are exceptions to that, but as a general rule, you have to be a U.S. citizen. Being a dual citizen or a naturalized U.S. citizen, not an issue. We'll talk about that in a particular section when I get to it. Uh, 
but this is your opening when you fill out the form to push forward information to mitigate potential concerns, which is generally what people don't do, usually because they just don't know it. I will say this is a form that is poorly written and at times very confusing, particularly because terms are not defined. And that makes it complicated, right, to fill out any particular form. Now, the other aspects of a clearance, you need to fit, there's three requirements. You need to fill out the proper forms like this SF-86. You need to sign a, a secrecy non-disclosure agreement. You need to favorably pass a background investigation. The extent of that background investigation will differ depending on what position you're up for, what clearance level you are up for. There are three levels, confidential, secret, and top secret. We almost never see a confidential clearance. It is almost always secret or top secret. You might be familiar with the terms top secret, uh, sensitive compartmented information, or TSSCI. SCI is not a separate clearance level. It is a compartment off of generally, if not invariably TS, but there can be secret SCI access too, but you probably won't see it. Uh, and then you need to have a need to know the information. So lots of people get clearances because they simply need access to the building to go to work, but they never access classified information. They don't have a need to know the classified information, which is simply just a relevancy determination. Uh, my colleague walking down the hallway who says, hello, how you doing? I have to make a judgment in that case right then and there. Do they have a need to know how I'm doing or at least what I'm working on at the moment? Um, and that is usually done individual to individual. In my case, as a lawyer who holds a private lawyer who holds a security clearance uh, at the high levels, then agencies make that determination as to whether or not I will have access to whatever information I might need for uh, my case. Uh, as we go along and evaluate and analyze the SF-86, feel free to put your questions in the chat. I will monitor it as well, and I'll be happy to, to address uh, the whatever you might have uh, as, as a potential factor. Uh, I will say disqualifying conditions are not necessarily bad things. If you marry a foreign national, congratulations, that's awesome. But it's a potential disqualifying factor, especially if your spouse now has family members who are overseas. Uh, and especially if those family members overseas work for that government in question. So that could impact your ability to maintain access or eligibility, even though it was a positive. Obviously, if you get a DUI or arrested, that's an obvious negative and potentially disqualifying factor. But almost all disqualifying factors have mitigating concerns or mitigating factors that can be used to overcome them. There almost is no fact pattern that can't be overcome, at least with time. If you tell me you did a line of cocaine yesterday, I'm going to have trouble getting you a security clearance. But if you said you did it last 10 years ago, I'm probably going to be able to get you your security clearance. So all of that is a factor. All right, so let me bring up the SF-86 as soon as I find where it went on my screen here. Okay, hopefully everybody can see that. So SF-86 just stands for Standard Form 86. It is the, the 86th form that OMB or OPM issued and then OMB, uh, Office of uh, Management and Budget, had, had approved. This form, as you can see, last revised uh, eight, almost eight years ago, uh, it is undergoing... Uh, another revision now, no clue of when that will actually happen, but they're constantly working on it. The first few pages, which uh, I absolutely recommend you read, give you a kind of overall summary of the whole process. It's actually quite helpful. What I will point out very specifically 
If you look right here, you see something different with the text. It's bolded. If you see bold text, other than obviously here's a just headings, if you see bold text within the form, and especially in a question, the government is telling you something. If you see bold text that is capitalized, the government is telling you something. They are emphasizing this is important. Very, very important. There's something different about that part of the question. Usually it will it will deal with the scope, how far back in time you need to go or how many people outside your immediate family you need to talk to in order to bring in information into the form. So pay very careful attention. Very often, you are given a short window to fill out this form, unfortunately. Uh, people ask me all the time, hey, I know I want to work in the national security environment. Can I get a clearance now? No. Unfortunately, you need to be sponsored in order to obtain a clearance. But if, to be smart, you want to be ahead of the game, thankfully, nowadays, the way the form is online, you can save it. So I would absolutely recommend, even though this may be a different form from what you ultimately fill out, I would if, if this is where you want to go, I would fill it out, save it on your computer so that you see what it is and you'll have a lot of the information already where hopefully you can copy and paste. And a lot of this information wouldn't change. You know, where you lived in the past, where you worked in the past, other than the time frame maybe falling outside of that scope would otherwise still be the same. So that will make all the difference in the world. The other thing I will say up front is you, once you submit this form to the government, make sure you save a copy. Save a hard copy that you print out, save multiple online copies on your desktop, your laptop, on a thumb drive, whatever. The government will always have copies of this form, no matter how far back you go. I mean, they have 30 years worth of it on me. And they will compare your answers from form to form. The background investigators who will be hired to handle you uh, may be a contractor, maybe someone who's frankly quite young and inexperienced and won't understand a lot of what they're actually asking you questions about. So the one thing they can do is at least go back and look at what you said on a previous answer to the same question and see if there's any inconsistencies. And if they do see an inconsistency, the reality is, for better or for worse, usually for worse, the government will assume you deliberately place that inconsistency or omission into the system. You're hiding something. That is their default thought. And you may, again, be able to address it, but you don't want to be there in the first place. I have had numerous clients, and I used to not understand how this could happen, but having done this now for almost 30 years, they would not put down that they had been arrested. They had forgotten they had been arrested, but they had said it on a prior form. So clearly they knew they had been arrested, but literally after X years went by, they forgot. I'm amazed. I see it genuinely. People sincerely just forget things. All right. So these first few pages, like I said, just instructions. Ah, see right here, retain a copy in bold. Good advice. Uh, it says that this form at the end should only take an hour and a half to do. Yeah, no way. This form can take you hours and hours and hours. If you provide a false statement or omission to this form, it is a potential felony under 18 USC 1001. It is considered to be a false statement. You could be prosecuted. Would you be? No. Uh, rarely do we see people prosecuted for this. Um, if it's part of a pattern of practice, sure, but, but it can cause you to lose your clearance, which ergo could end up having you lose your job, whatever that might be. Oh, actually it says 150 minutes. So what is that? Uh, almost an two hour, two, what is it? 120 minutes, two and a half hours. I can tell you it takes way more than that. Okay. We'll go through some of these quickly, um, because there's... Uh, just obvious. Uh, so you'll see 
right? These are interactive, even though actually this is a version on my computer, not online. These are interactive boxes uh, and they are drop down boxes. Now, sometimes there's still a problem with some of the forms. So like this, is it letting me? Like it will not allow me to delete this one here. I mean, it is a required one, but there are actually forms where I think it says I am from Afghanistan because it wouldn't let me fix it. Uh, but uh, this first sections are all just kind of bio biographical. Other names, you know, nicknames that you really did use or for, you know, uh, my dad's name is Ronald. He goes by Ron also. That would be a difference so that he would have to put down, you know, this would be Ronald. Ron would be here. So, you know, uh, Mitchell Mitch, you know, whatever it might be. Or if you have an actual nickname that people really use, a friend of mine, a colleague of mine goes by Butch. That's literally what everybody calls him. I don't even know if I know what his real name is uh, offhand, but that would be on because obviously the government wants to be able to look you up wherever you might be online, uh, especially online. And it, it does ask uh, for at least email addresses. What it doesn't ask for yet, I suspect, and I hope, quite frankly, this is coming, it will start to ask you about what your social media accounts are. What are your usernames on Twitter, Instagram, TikTok, whatever it might be. Uh, the Teixeira case that we just saw, the National Guardsman who pled guilty under the Espionage Act, is a perfect example of why the government needs to know where you are online. Now, that doesn't mean they're going to ask you for passwords. No, they will not. They will only, hopefully, be properly looking for what you have created as a public record. And that is something you should always take into account, not just for the government, but for private sector too, right? Check your social media accounts to see what your privacy settings are to make sure that you don't have photographs, posts, information out there that could negatively impact you. It may make your fraternity or brothers or sorority sisters really happy to see your partying photos, but maybe not a prospective employer or the US government. I will also say this is the opening form. There may be supplemental security forms agencies will have you fill out. Some of them may in fact be inconsistent or supplementary to this form. So when we get to section 19 to talk about foreign nationals, we it doesn't include dual US citizens, but a separate form, especially in the intelligence community, may ask you to list all dual nationals. All right, so section eight, passport info, section nine, citizenship. Dual citizenship is not a disqualifier for a security clearance. The exercise of dual citizenship is potentially disqualifying. If you vote overseas, if you derive benefits or privileges from the fact that you have a dual citizenship, uh, for the possibility that you might inherit property in that other country or use their passport. Now, there are variations to all of that. Some of them are very specific. I'm happy to address any specific questions about that. But just having citizenship, not a problem. Tons, thousands and thousands of, of people have security clearances and maintain dual citizenships. When you get that dual citizenship is also a factor. If you get it as an adult, uh, that will demonstrate loyalty to another country versus you obtained it as a child because of the fact of your parents or you didn't have a choice because you were a minor. So all factors. And you'll see like right here's multiple just forms that like I wouldn't fill out any of these because I only have my one citizenship. So I'll just be able to skip them. Uh, right. Again, right. Bold and capitalized. Have you ever? There are a number of countries. Now, people will often ask, all right, uh, what should I do with my dual citizenship? Should I renounce it? No, do not. For one thing, that's a shame if you would ever have to do that. Uh, I used to have clients do that all the time, especially if they were from Iran or Russia 
or you know countries Iraq that were adversarial in nature to us we would have them go to their embassy or the interest section say I don't want to be you know part of your country anymore take my passport renounce my citizenship uh fill out a bunch of forms and then finally one country said when they stood up congratulations and the person went well why well, clearly you have just obtained a, or are in the process of obtaining a a, a U.S. security clearance, because why else would you give up your citizenship? I mean, there's no reason to do it. So it became a national security threat. So what you would do when you fill, if you are a dual citizen and you're filling this out, have you taken any action to renounce? No, but I am willing to renounce my foreign citizenship. That right there is the mitigation and all you need. I have never, ever seen a U.S. agency say, okay, go ahead and do it. At least in the couple of times when I've seen it, they were wrong and I fixed it so that the person didn't have to do it because that is not what the policy is of the U.S. government. Uh, some security officers just don't understand. Now, ever means... For example, some countries, if you take on a second citizenship, you forfeit your original. So India, for example, you forfeit Indian citizenship if you become a U.S. citizen, but you still once held it. And that still does give you some benefits, etc. Some citizenships you can't give up. I won't focus any more on it because it might be that none of you who are on this session uh, I have a question on it because you're not a dual national, but certainly anyone who ever wants to follow up on that in the chat or else otherwise later, by all means. Um, so again, you'll see questions like this ever been issued, ever used the passport or identity card. Okay, let's skip down. Where have you lived? In bold, 10 years now, not required to list temporary locations of less than 30 that weren't your permanent or mailing address. Usually this would apply to, yeah, lucky if you're in college or grad school and you're maybe going back home to your parents' house for the summer, right? That could be an issue. Uh, or if you're military and you're you know, being moved around a lot or, or federal and going TDY, temporary duty, uh, it became more of an issue during COVID because People were going somewhere else for a period of longer than 90 days. So that became an issue. If you lived on a college campus in more than one uh, dorm room, then, or more than one dorm, each of those would have to be listed. And I will, I see absolutely for anyone who wants to contact me outside of this, by all means, do not hesitate to address, uh, to email me. Uh for most of these questions, you are going to be asked for a verifier. Now, again, here, do not list people who knew you outside. Don't list your spouse, cohabitant, or other relatives as verifiers. Cohabitant, you'll see this term throughout the form. That does not mean roommate or housemate. That is referring to a partner, your boyfriend, girlfriend, who lives with you in your residence. You also will say it will show don't list the same people in multiple places. Verifiers you can have. That's okay. Someone who knew you to list at each of these uh, residents or for, for your employment. Uh, but they don't want, for example, the people you'll list in Section 16, which are your references to have them anywhere else on the particular form. Now, you may need to look up all of this information. You know, I don't remember some of my addresses from years ago. Uh, hopefully 10 years ago, I do. Uh, but at least maybe a phone number at the time could be an issue. And here's where you have choices, right? Provide someone who knew you at that address. Well, don't provide the neighbor who didn't like you, right? Provide, this is where you want to feed positive information into the system to make sure that those people who get asked about you are going to provide good and favorable information. You will also see at times answers of, I don't know. And that's fine. That's an answer. So if you don't know the contact information for your neighbor, that that's a legitimate answer. 
particularly when it's a foreign national as we get further, this is a very important answer because you do not want to go talk to the foreign national for purposes of obtaining information because now you have just created a new contact with that foreign national that you have to report. Uh, and you don't, that is, that is something you don't want. So you'll see there's multiple pages for section 11 because they envision that you've lived in multiple or possibly in multiple locations. So uh, we can skip all down. Uh, education. Uh, the only key thing about this is to understand they will, they, the government, will go back and investigate if, in fact, you really did graduate. <laughs> so if you're going to say you graduated from Hopkins, make sure that you actually did uh, and you weren't four credits shy uh, of, of whatever was required. Because uh, that's an easy one. The, the U.S. government will go pull your transcript. Uh, and again, you're right. They ask for someone who knew you, you know, give the professor who gave you an A and you really like rather than the professor who failed you. Again, look at all these places that they assume that you might have gone to school. All right. Section 13 is a key one because this is where often people trip themselves up. For one thing, unemployment is employment in this context. If you are unemployed for the summer because you know you studied abroad and then you just didn't have time to really get something, or hell, you wanted to take time off and just relax or go traveling, that's fine. It's an unemployment period and you'll need someone to verify that you were. That could be your spouse, your parent, your CPA who knew you weren't working that during that time frame. whatever, that's fine. You're going back here 10 years, right, in bold, and no breaks, right? The key, as it says, that's why unemployment matters, must be accounted for without a break. Now, what in this section becomes the problem? One, again, consider who are you going to put down as your supervisor? If you had an issue with a supervisor, was there a second level supervisor? Was there a co-supervisor? Is there someone else at least you can put down to decide rather than the one you had a problem with? Because this question will ask whether or not, as we skim down, right? These are all different sections for different types of employment here. Whether or not what happened in the last seven years, right? We're going back 10 years for employment, but in the last seven years for each of these, why'd you leave? Well, maybe it's an easy one. I left because I took another job. I, I took a job that paid me more money. I left because I went to school. Okay, perfect. But what about here? If there is something, were you fired, quit, after being told you'd fired, left by mutual agreement, here's where a problem arises. Following charges or allegations of misconduct. What does that mean? Not defined left by mutual agreement, unsatisfactory performance, not defined, a little bit more understandable, right, of what that likely means. But you may not or may have a different opinion as to what happened in your job as your job might have of you. Now, maybe it's something when we were younger, you know, most of us when we were in school, we probably worked at a summer camp or maybe in a restaurant or a bar or something. And it wouldn't have been uncommon that we're like, you know what? We just left. I quit. No notice. You know, I just left. I don't like this anymore. Uh, guys are jerk to me. I just quit. And you think you quit, but they wrote down in your file that you were fired or you're not eligible to be rehired because of how you left them. And you have no idea about that. Well, the government is going to go and look and verify all of these if they have the time, as they should, to check to see what happened with that job. So if you know that there was an issue, you are much better off to reveal it. It is always better to affirmatively reveal something to the government and mitigate it than to let the government find out. Because again, like I said in the beginning, if the government thinks you intentionally left this information off, they will assume you did so for malicious, nefarious purposes. So if you say, you know, um, and sometimes I will even say no, but I will put 
the client or have the client put a supplemental form that says, no, but there was a circumstance. I'm not sure what they might say because I was in a, a fight with my boss uh, and they kept saying I showed up late because where would late be? Is that unsatisfactory performance? Maybe, but was it by mutual agreement? Maybe not. You know, maybe they said, you know, you keep showing up late. I don't like the way you're doing this. And you're like, you know what? I, I don't want to deal with this anymore. So I quit. That doesn't fit nicely, but much better to say that happened. I have rarely, if ever, seen the U.S. government care if you had some nonsensical issue with a prior employer. As long as you didn't commit a crime or you weren't doing something unethical, they don't care if you got fired because you fell asleep at work beforehand. There's just not going to be an issue from a security clearance standpoint. It might be an issue for a suitability standpoint. Those terms overlap very much. And I should say another form that you might be filling out is an SF-85P, as in public trust. A public trust is not a security clearance. We call it security clearance light. It's a much smaller, shorter form, about 20 pages. It is a suitability determination of trustworthiness, which is very much the factor for a clearance, but it is not a security clearance. It does not give you access to classified information. Uh, oftentimes, I'll have someone come to me and say, I got denied a clearance, and they refused to give me due process. And I'm like, well, that's not how it works. It's required by law. Show me the documentation. And it is always that they got denied a public trust position uh, determination, not a clearance. There is no appeal for a public trust determination other than what I can create as a lawyer, which sometimes I can. But they're not the same thing. So I'm going to skip all the way down because this is all, look, they just assume you're going to have all these jobs. And it's all these different categories of information. And here it will say, right, if you were active duty, okay, go to A1, A5, and A6. All right, unemployment only fill out A4. It's confusing, right? I teach people how to do this. I have filled these forms out for 25 plus years. I will say I still screw it up every once in a while. I'll forget I went to Canada for the weekend or whatever it might be. Uh, but thankfully, because nowadays the old the new form repopulates with your old info, which is a good thing. So you don't have to fill it out again. Although it can be a bad thing because it doesn't know that the information falls outside of scope. So like the 10 years for section 13, it might have jobs you had 15 years ago and you have to make sure to just delete that because that's not what the question asks. Only answer what the question asks. That said, my strongest piece of advice is uh, what I was told uh, by a lawyer inside the government about this and I agreed with wholeheartedly, don't lawyerize the form. Because again, there are sections and words that are vague and undefined. This isn't interpretation of a contract. This is making sure the government knows information that it wants to know to assess you for a clearance. So don't go, well, I'm pretty confident I could work my way around that question and still be right by a contract term. But if the government finds out about it, they'd be like, how could you not reveal that to us? Of course, that's what we wanted to know. All right. Skipping down. Section 14, just for us men, uh, at least for now, selective service. Good thing, thankfully, about this. If you don't know your selective service number, you just go to the, the SS's website here and you can look it up. And that's easy enough. Military history, have you ever ever served? Uh, for those, if we haven't, boom, we just skip to the next one so we don't have to worry about it. If you have, it will obviously ask you about your branch, the years, your rank, uh, what, what your discharge was, et cetera. Uh, and, you know, have you suffered any discipline as a result uh, of any of this? Uh, which unless someone tells me they were military and has a specific question, uh, I'm not going to go through it. Uh, ever served outside in another country's military, which I certainly have had as clients. 
who had mandatory military service in Israel, in Switzerland, in Afghanistan, whatever it might be, uh, obviously going to be a factor and potentially disqualifying, though generally I think I've always gotten somebody a clearance for it. Section 16, people who know you well, covers at least seven years. Don't list your spouse, former spouse, or other relatives. I don't think most of us would list our former spouse for, for, for a reference, but you never know. Uh, all right. So I always advise best to pick someone who had or has a security clearance. The more prominent and high profile by a reputational standpoint, the better, uh, or not even the better, helpful. If if you don't know anyone who had a clearance, if you only know you know, your best friends are from when you were in college and, and you've known them for 15, five years, 15, or seven years, 20 years, whatever it might be, that's fine. Not a problem. These people will be contacted. They will be interviewed in more detail. Uh, they will be asked about your alcoholic use, your drug use, if any. Can they be, can you be trusted? You know, what? where's your loyalty lie? Is there, they'll, they're going to get some open-ended questions. So give some thought as to who you put, obviously, on this form. If your best friend from college you have known for 15 years, they are like your brother or sister. You love them dearly. That's a great reference. But if you smoked pot with them all the freaking time and you don't know if your answer for how much you smoked pot is going to be the same as their answer from what they remember of you, that's a potential problem. Now, I don't want you to coordinate what their answers are going to be. And you you do want to give them warning and heads up that you put them down as a reference because they're going to get contacted by a federal agent or background investigator. But, you know, if you say, no, you know, when I was in college, sure, I smoked pot all the time. We we're mostly almost always on the weekends. And they say, no, oh, God, we smoked pot. We got high like every single night. That's an inconsistency. That's going to be a problem. 17 marital, you know, were you ever in? Obviously now, you know, legally recognized domestic partnership, civil union, et cetera. What your status is, I'm divorced. I will always have to put down that fact and my ex-wife's contact information. And they will be contacted. The U.S. government knows, because more than 50% of us have been divorced, that the likelihood is, thankfully not in my case, that your ex will say bad things about you. And they will take that, you know, in understanding that that's the case. So don't freak out that your ex is going to be contacted. Section 18 deals with your immediate family members. And again, section 17 will also deal with your cohabitant, which for all intents and purposes is considered to be your spouse for that part of the form. Section 18 defines who they're talking about in this category, right? So that doesn't count aunts and uncles, grandparents, it's a very specific category. And this category can change. Now, having a family member become deceased doesn't change it. That will still be filled out on this form. But I don't have in-laws anymore because I got divorced. So that changed. Or my mom passed away, so she's still on the form, but my dad remarried. So I have a stepmother. And that means I, and I doesn't mean, but I also have now a stepbrother. Uh, so that goes on the form, right? So that can change depending on what happens in your particular life. Now, this is a section where you can go ask your family member for certain information because they uh, are, depending on what their status is going to be, may have some form information that you need with respect to their citizenship or their passport information. Now, uh, okay, that's and and we'll talk about you know how often you talk to the family member, etc. Uh, and and that could be a factor depending on who they are, or maybe they have a maybe they have a criminal record. Have had that many times with clients. Maybe they're a foreign national. Uh, you know, all of that can become a factor. And this is where you can mitigate information. Your father lives in Iran and is an Iranian citizen. Um, but you 
hate their guts and you have no contact with them whatsoever. So that would all go in here where you indicate that that's the case because that will mitigate the fact that the parent is in Iran. Or, or you could say you do talk to them, but you would put in information uh, on a supplemental page or, or section of, you know, they have never, and this is the same for section 19 for foreign national contacts. They, they never ask me inappropriate or suspicious or probing questions. They don't know that I am up for a security clearance. You know, they don't know where I work, uh, whatever that might be. So those would all mitigate those possible concerns. Section 19, obviously, it assumes you have lots of family members. Section 19 is another section, especially for those of us here in the D.C. area. If you, hey, if you live in Iowa, maybe it's not going to be an issue at all because you don't know any foreign nationals. Uh, but here in D.C., we, you know, you can't help but step over them. Uh, and in fact, obviously, at Hopkins. You know, constantly, you're, you're probably going to be in class with them, or maybe one of your professors uh, might be. Here is a definition. Who is not a citizen or national of the U.S.? Again, dual nationals are not a foreign national because they are a U.S. citizen. A national of the U.S. is a very small subcategory, like somebody who's from Micronesia or Guam, a territory of the United States. Now, do you have? Have you had close and important and or? It is not or. I hear this all the time from senior U.S. government officials, heads of intelligence agencies who I've represented, who think it's close or continuing contact. No, close and or continuing contact with a foreign national, per definition, in bold, seven years. So what's that mean? Have you had, if you dated a foreign national five years ago, engaged to be married, they cheated on you, you broke up, you hate their guts, haven't spoken to them since, never going to speak to them again. Well, they still go on your form because it's within seven years, even though it was five years. Hey, six years, 364 days ago. Now they may fall off your form for the next time, but for now they're on the form. How do you mitigate that? I hate, I, you write on the form, I hate their guts. They're never, never going to talk to them again. That would be mitigating. They don't know that I'm up for this job. You know, I haven't talked to them. With whom you or your spouse or partner or cohabitant. So this is where you got to go talk to one of these people if they exist. Technically more than one can exist. And ask them, do you have anyone who fits this definition? And that person may be someone you don't even know as the person filling out the form. But the fact is your spouse or whomever could be subject to influence and then influence you. So it's these criteria. Now, what's close and or continuing? Not defined. So basic dictionary terms uh, apply. And, and this is going to be very, very fact specific. And I don't want you to over-report in this section. I don't want you to under-report in this section. Because if you add in more people later, the government is suspicious. If you add too many people who don't need to be listed, they're all going to be looked at. And you never know if you put someone on there who causes you problems and they never needed to be on there in the first place. So let's, an example, you're in a class and you have 30 students fellow students in your Hopkins class. You know who basically everybody is. You recognize them. You probably know their name. And you know someone there is some prince from some country. But you know what? You've never talked to them. You've never interacted with them outside of class. You're, uh, or you're not even in a group project together. You just know who they are because of who they are. Probably not going to be a reportable contact. But no, you're in a study group together and you meet once a week, okay, probably reportable then, but also are bound by affection, influence, common interest, obligation. None of these terms are defined. Basically, dictionary application, what is 
affection, you know, love. I care about the person. It doesn't have to be love, love in the sense of, you know, I'm going to get married. My really good friend, roommate, right? Influence. My professor, who I respect a great deal and influenced me. Common interests, not a clue. Everything. What the hell does common interests mean? Everything. Uh, we're in the class together. We're in a group together. I mean, they added that seven years ago in this form. And it's a, it's a nightmare because it just it's like kitchen sink. Obligation, I don't know, you know, you lent money, you borrowed money, whatever it might be. And again, same thing as you saw in section 18. How, what are the methods of contact? What's the frequency of contact? Which you might have to estimate, obviously. The nature of the relationship. All right, you know, what countries are they from? Birth Here, again, I don't know. Birthplace, I don't know. Current address, I don't know. Perfectly fine to list all that. Now, how do you find this out? Don't ask, like I said. Now, if you're on Facebook with them, you might go online and look at their Facebook page. Some of this information they might have added. And if they did, that's great. Don't look at them on LinkedIn unless you have a, 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 a premier account that you've paid for. Because if you look at them on LinkedIn on a regular account, they see you looked at them. And maybe that spurs them to contact you and say, hey, I saw you checked out my profile. How you been? I've been thinking about you. Now you have another contact that you need to list. So don't do that. Don't cull your social media. Oh my God, I don't want to have any contact with foreign nationals. I delete everybody, unfriend them all on Facebook. Delete them all off of, of LinkedIn. Don't do that. They may notice and then contact you as a result. In any way, if it's a passive relationship, don't worry about it. There's no specific rule. I'll tell you my rule, my advice. I'm older. I'm on Facebook. I like Facebook. If all I do, if all I am is connected to them and I don't do anything, not reportable. If I post on their page, happy birthday, because the system reminded me it's their birthday, not reportable. But if I send them direct messages or I post other things on their their uh, page affirmatively or they do the same back, something that needs to be reported. And again, you mitigate. Uh, I also never want you to speculate on things. You know, only put down information that you know. So again, are they connected to a government? Uh, not that I know of. Uh, or you can say, you know, can say that. Or... Look, you know, uh, the reality is in most major cities, dry cleaners are probably going to be people or the food vendors down on the mall in D.C., very likely from another country originally. I don't know if they're a dual national or not. I'm not going to ask them. Most of the time, even though I interact with them every day, that's probably not a reportable contact, even though they know I like a sausage with peppers and onions because I go to them every day. Um you know, again, very fact specific that we would need to talk about. Section 19 would also be where you put your foreign relatives who aren't in the categories of Section 18, like an aunt or uncle, a grandparent, excuse me, or a cousin who fit the definition of Section 19 qualification or parameters. Section 20 is all about also foreign uh, relationships and activities. I'm going to go through them quickly uh, and and just focus on the key ones. Uh, ever, ever held a foreign bank account? I never understand this. I lived in England in 1988 when I studied abroad. I had a bank account. I closed it when I left in April of 88. I still have to put that down on this form for whatever reason. I'm sure I could probably come up with a reason. That one seems a little bit ridiculous, but okay. Um, Stock that is in a portfolio, I'm blanking on what the term is when you own a, like a mutual fund. If you own a mutual fund and it has foreign, uh, there it is right in front of me, and you have foreign stocks in that, no, that that's not what they're concerned about at all. It, uh, so don't worry about that. But it's only if you have specific uh, financial interests overseas. Uh, ever had any foreign financial interest someone else controlled on your behalf? Again, very fact specific. I'm not going to stay with it. Uh, I always love this. Do you anticipate owning 
real estate in a foreign country. Hell yeah, I do. I'm going to buy the world. I would like to. I'm never going to be able to have the money. No, they're not. They're not. That's what not what they want to know, right? Uh, I I dream of owning Iceland or Greenland. I suppose if President Trump comes back into office to buy Greenland. No, that's not what they're talking about. But do you have family overseas who, if they die, and ultimately they will, and if they're older than you, hopefully before you, you may inherit that property. And that may be an issue. So that could be a potential problem. Maybe you will say as mitigation that if willing, uh, how, how would you phrase it? You'd phrase it, if requested by the US government, I am willing to sell the property. If requested by the US government, I am willing to cede the property over to my relatives. Um, you know, it may be a, you only get $15,000 property and you don't care. Uh, so why have the hassle? But it could also be that one of the mitigating factors would be, hey, yeah, I just, I've had this. I own a million dollar home in another country because I'm a billionaire and I own hundreds of millions of dollar property anywhere else. So you know what? If that country takes that house, I really don't care. That would be mitigation. Uh, are you eligible to receive any benefits and stuff? Again, you know, uh, as a U.S. citizen, because if you're dual, maybe you still have the ability to get stuff or your spouse may get. Again, the concern is that somehow that other country can use that as leverage against you or your spouse or partner, cohabitant or dependent children to influence you. Ever provided financial support for a foreign national? can get tricky. I've had au pairs. Am I providing financial support for a foreign national? Mm, yes or no? Depends. Uh, if it is a nanny, very often a lot of people are doing that kind of under the table, or even if they're declaring it, uh, which is would be the proper way to do it, uh, paying social security taxes, etc., you're paying it directly to them. I went through a service with, a, with an au pair so I'm actually technically paying the American company who's then paying the au pair. So it just depends on the facts of that situation. Uh, although, uh, you know, they're talking, that's not usually what the government's going to care about. Uh, and of course, my au pair would also be listed in Section 19, as well as here, because they are a foreign national contact living in my house. Uh, you know, they're more interested, are you providing your relatives overseas, which is the common equation, you know, X amount of money every month. And you might need to stop that. Again, very fact specific. Uh, provided advice or support to a business or foreign organization that you haven't listed as a foreign employer. Obviously, for many of us who are doing a lot of overseas traveling, who are doing stuff in this area, which may involve foreign companies, that could come up. Uh, if anyone is a lawyer, this can get complicated if you have foreign clients and attorney-client privilege. It, it's, it's a very gray area of what you reveal and what you don't reveal, sometimes that you can't reveal. Uh, something I can talk about with anyone if you have a specific question about that or separately. Uh, have you been asked to provide advice or serve as a consultant, even informally? Wow, that is really flexible and vague again, would have to be fact specific for us to talk about to see if it would make sense. You'll also see a lot in this section to answer no if this was official US government business. Uh, so a lot of times, same thing with travel, going to conferences, things like that. If you did it as a government representative, then no, you're not gonna be expected to reveal it. Offered a job, asked to work, consider or consider employment. Again, this kind of vague notion of, yeah, you know, wow, I'd like to work for Euro Disney, which is probably owned, has a subsidiary that is owned in a French country, French government or, or French uh, company, you know, would that count? But I'm never going to work for Euro Disney. Consider, so it, it, some of this, you, you just got to talk it through and, and think rationally. Uh, business venture with a foreign national not described above. Uh, oh, I see. Uh, Two-part question. 
Uh, we get multiple offers, and hopefully these aren't come. I think these are in the general population. I won't say the name. Uh, get multiple offers from different agencies and adjudicators at one agency deny you a clearance. Can you still get cleared by another agency? Yes. Uh, the good thing is uh, being denied at one agency doesn't necessarily mean you can't get cleared by another. Now, typically, that there would be a one-year requirement before you reapply. That can be waived. And it will also depend on you could be denied SCI, but not denied and in fact hold a what we call collateral access at secret or top secret. If you are initially denied a clearance and appeal, can you still be in the clearance process for another agency? The short answer would be yes. It does get complicated and inconsistently applied as to how agencies react to when there is a denial when you are cleared by them. Uh, so someone is a contractor and cleared at the Defense Department at the top secret level and gets denied a clearance at the CIA for SCI, you need to tell your security officer there's a number of factors that come into play, doesn't come into play on this form, where you should and really need to affirmatively tell either your facility security officer, which is the contracting representative who interacts with the US government or the security officer in your federal agency, that you got arrested or you took on a dual citizenship or you married a dual national or you got denied uh, by a, a, a clearance uh, at a another agency because all of that could obviously come into play with respect to your current eligibility. Uh, hold dual citizenship, US and Russia, having Russian citizenship and an elderly mother impact. Yes, always. So potentially disqualifying, but doesn't mean you can't get TSSCI. I have had countless Russian clients, dual citizens, uh, who do uh, obtain clearance, uh, or we've either re reversed a denial or they've been able to get it. I will say, statistically speaking, literally 97, 98% of clearance applicants get cleared. I mean, amazing statistics. I mean, right, I'd love to go up to Maryland Live Casino or MGM with that type of odds. But that 2 to 3%, there's like 5, 6 million people who have clearances. So that means I've got 40,000, 50,000 potential clients, which is why I can stay in business in doing this. Um, but... Obviously, there, there's a lot of the same types of cases, foreign influence and foreign preference guideline B and C of the adjudicative guidelines. When you look at them, this type of situation that Ludmilla has, very common. Actually, the most common denial for clearance is financial reasons, which is a different section we haven't gotten to yet. Uh, I don't often see those cases because they can't afford to pay me to help them out. The sad part is it's the easiest of the denial factors to actually overcome. So for Ludmilla and anyone else who has foreign relatives overseas, traveling to those locations adds potentially disqualifying factors. It doesn't mean it will be, but it, it adds to it. I have had clients, and I will never advise someone this is what you need to do, but they have made the decision not to go to their family member's funeral because it was overseas. I will never make that, that decision for someone. That's a very personal decision, but depending on the country and depending on the situation and who you work for, that's a factor that really needs to be taken into consideration. I would definitely say don't vote in the other country. Uh, that said, hey, if it's something you know unbelievable where you know, this country, you know, the Soviet Union broke up and Ukraine is voting for the first time and you want to be that person. Hey, that's a that's a personal decision to make about that. Uh, if you do recruiters do, if you the client does not want employees. Uh, all right. They ask why you haven't renounced your Russian citizenship. Yeah. These are ignorant people asking you questions about that because you never want to renounce your citizenship unless asked to by the U.S. government. The reality is if you have multiple citizenships, you may be valuable to the U.S. government to have that. And maybe they want to use you for that purpose uh, later on. The, the way to mitigate that is you just say, I'm willing to renounce if asked. 
But I will tell you, if you are asked, you need to come and talk to me because that is likely someone who's ignorant telling you to do that. I literally had a client who had British citizenship and somebody was telling them to renounce their British citizenship. Are you crazy? That is the most idiotic thing in the world. No professional security officer who knows what they're doing would ever ask that. But not everybody in the U.S. government, frankly, is uh, frankly the most brilliant person in the world. So that's just how it is. Is being put on administrative leave of your current job going to affect the ability? So I would need to know what is, and you don't have to answer this, uh, Dennis, what, what is meant by administrative leave? Uh, you're on administrative leave because you're being investigated for sexual harassment allegations. Well, that's going to be something that could come up and probably we want to explain in the forum to mitigate, regardless of whether it's been resolved favorably or unfavorably at not. Uh, or are you on administrative leave because you're taking time off to go to school? Obviously, that's not going to be uh, an issue. Uh, a suspension of a clearance, I will say, is not considered an adverse action. Uh, it is uh, considered uh, a non-adverse that has no appeal rights for it, uh, even though sometimes I can create one, uh, which we can talk about separately. Uh, as I said, at conferences, trade shows, I'm going to skip ahead. All right, this one often can create a problem. There is a definition immediate family and this gets into now parents step you know etc cetera, etc cetera. it's all explained right here this is contact with a foreign government official other than routine embassy uh matters uh you know you're getting a visa all right and dennis said for a safety work i need to know more dennis you can mess you can email me and I, and i can give you some more advice i don't want to take too much for the interaction here. But uh, if you want to give me more information, I can definitely respond. Uh, so this has no time frame other than I'm talking seven years, but other than in section 19, where you have to have affection, close and or continuing obligation, etc. This is literally, did you run into them? So did you meet somebody for three minutes? Then technically, this is a response here that yes, uh, like I had some contact with a French government official recently, only on email on behalf of a client of mine. I am now gonna have to, I had to write myself a note because I'm gonna forget. Five years from now, I'm not gonna remember I had that conversation, but that is going to be for the next seven years, a reportable contact of this uh, section with that French national, French government official who I never met, only emailed. And I'm going to have to fill all this information out and explain why, you know, subject to attorney client privilege, although that's not really a privilege conversation, could be attorney work product. So I have to figure that all out. Uh, if you use a mistake on it, uh, on your form, how do you deal with that? Great question, because it happens all the time. Uh, you forgot to list something you want to add. It depends on what it is. If it's something insignificant, I literally did forget I went to Canada one weekend, then I just told the investigator that when we met. If it's something significant, like a um, something that would be more adverse, you can file a, an SF-86C, like Cookie Monster C, uh, which is just a supplemental form. And I, I do advise at times trying to feed that into the system. It's, it's all about uh, showing the government that you are affirmatively providing the information rather than them pulling it out from you. But a lot of times you can just tell the, the representative, the background investigator, uh, or your security officer ab about it. But again, it would depend on what it is. Provide the purpose, subsequent any subsequent contact with this foreign government. You know, you could say, no, I have no further plans to ever contact them. Uh, or I am willing to sever contact, including with your foreign national friends, if you're willing to say that. I'm willing to sever contact upon request. Uh, I, I have rarely seen the government ever ask, although once I literally had someone get divorced as a result because the government said, if you divorce that person, 
uh, we'll let you keep your clearance. And clearly uh, that marriage wasn't very important to that person, but they did it. They actually did it. Um, sponsored a foreign national to come to the US, uh, et cetera, et cetera. And then uh, have you held political office in a foreign country? Have you voted in a foreign country? All right, travel, maintain your passports. Uh, you know, they will ask you for them. I love saving my passports to remind myself where I went. They will ask you to uh, either you to scan them in or photocopy in them, or the investigator may do that. Uh, and all of this, most of this is going to be no. Like, did you have any problems when you were there? Any encounters with the police, the military? Were you detained, etc.? Anything happened suspicious? And if it's yes, you explain, uh, but no, 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 no. You know, why'd you go there? You do have to come up with at least the estimated dates. You know, so I once tried to tell one of the agencies, I went on a cruise in the Caribbean for a week and that's all I did. They're like, no, what countries did you go to? I'm like, holy cow, I don't remember what countries I went to. Like literally we went to some of them for three hours, you know, but you got to remember what, what it was or write down where you went. For all of it. And this is something that is becoming uh, more easily easier for the government to check uh, as all the systems are integrated from country to country, uh, especially through computer systems. Section 21. All right, I'm going to, I always run out of time on this stuff. 21, very important. You can have, this is the lengthy explanation. Having a psychological or mental health issue or counseling, not a reason for revocation or denial, oftentimes can be mitigated. Um, it's going to ask very specific things. I will tell you the government could care less if you have OCD, ADD, ADHD, whatever. You could be bipolar, schizophrenic, and still get your security clearance. As long as you are under control, you have a healthcare professional who will be asked to provide information not privileged information, but weigh in on your situation to say, I, the doctor, I treat this person. They are on their medication. I see them you know, regularly. I have no reason to believe there is a concern at all. And most of this is also talking about, you know, ever, ever with all sorts of stuff. Have you been required? Have you been involuntarily admitted? Have you been voluntarily admitted, hospitalized? Very straightforward questions here. Uh, diagnosed, right? Guessing that you think you have an issue. Don't guess. No speculation again. This is diagnosed. Don't speculate on what you think you were diagnosed. Ask your doctor, what was my diagnosis? Uh, get your medical records so that you have them. All right. And this is not talking about grief counseling because you lost a family member or you're getting divorced. That, that is not what is going. And here, substantially, do you have a condition that substantially, adversely affects judgment, reliability, or trustworthiness? All right, 22 arrests, police record. You know, again, uh, people, what happens in this? Uh, you got arrested in college for drinking, uh, open container law, whatever, some stupid prank with the fraternity. And it got expunged or DUIs get expunged all the time, especially first timers. That still gets reported. The judge might have told you, your lawyer might have told you, the prosecutor might have told you, don't worry, it's like it never happened. No, it's like it legally never happened. It factually happened. You have to tell the US government unless it's in these two sections, which I have never seen in 30 years. So if you got a DUI and got it expunged, that's awesome. You still list it because maybe you have a new DUI years later, and maybe that's a pattern or indicative of an alcohol problem. That's why the government wants to know. So again, bold, seven years. Have you had any of these? Now, some of these may fall off you, you know, uh, from this, depending on the scope. Um, and you give the, this is where you give a lot of details. If you follow the instruction here, it doesn't give a lot of details. This is where you might want to give more details to mitigate what the concern was uh, that led to the arrest. Uh, jump down. 
ever, 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 ever. So you might have had a misdemeanor offense, but it in, it was a DUI that will always be listed or smoking pot, doing coke, whatever, and you got arrested, always will be listed. Firearms or explosives, uh, domestic violence, or you know, even if it was an allegation, although this is a conviction right here, charged with a felony offense, only charged. It might have been completely done away with, but you still are always going to have to list it. Again, putting in information. Now, um, domestic violence protective order, restraining order. There are civil versions of this. There are criminal versions of this. Could make a difference as to what you have. That's something to, dis to discuss. Uh, illegal drugs. All right, the big takeaway from this section, everyone. Marijuana, doesn't matter if it's legal. Hey, in D.C., mushrooms. Doesn't matter if it's illegal in a local jurisdiction. Doesn't matter if it's legal overseas. And by the way, marijuana is not legal in Amsterdam for foreigners. It's legal for them. They just tolerate that we foreigners might use it, but actually it's illegal. In any event, federal law still prohibits it. Within our lifetime, we will see marijuana be treated as alcohol, as long as you don't abuse it, don't use it at work, don't use it while driving, but we're not there yet. So you would explain if you use marijuana, oh, I was recreationally experimenting. It was youthful experimentation. I'm never going to use it again. Uh, all this good mitigating factors. All right, let me just jump back. Michael, if I were a minor, does that mean uh, that I report? So the question... Uh, does talk about how it's always seven years, so it would depend on how you how old you are now, and it also depends on what it was on an ever. So an ever would, yeah, but being a minor is going to be very mitigating uh, for the situation because you're going to be assumed not to have been able to exercise as good judgment as you would as an adult. And if you don't remember the exact date because it was so long ago, that's fine. You would just note that uh, on the forum. You may be able to do some research to obviously pull it up uh, if you can. Uh, so drugs, prescription medication, misuse of that is illegal. So if you are prescribed sleeping pills and, and you give it to a friend, that's illegal. Or you take it from a friend. That's illegal. If you use your ADHD medication to help you study or because it gives you a recreational high, that's misuse of it. Don't do it. Or don't use someone else's ADA, ADD medication or ADHD medication for purposes of studying. Illegal. That is reportable. Now, this is changing, like I said, about marijuana use and stuff. So, for example, most I used to say when I started this years ago, decades ago, I want at least five years of no marijuana use. Now, agencies like the CIA are like, as long as you didn't use it within the last 90 days, we don't care. Now, one thing I will uh, emphasize here, if you held a clearance and you left your job for good, for positive, let's say you left for school and you don't have access, you are still eligible and you may still hold your clearance. So was your involvement while possessing? Yes, and that's a problem. So just because you're not in access doesn't mean you have a clearance. So that's something uh, to discuss. Um, this section and the alcohol section, which is the next one, all talk about the same stuff on like, have you been committed involuntarily? Have you been voluntarily, et cetera? Uh, has it had a negative impact on your work or professional relationships? You know, did did your spouse say, honey, I'm going to leave you if you don't stop drinking? Eh, yeah, that's 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 a yes here. You know, even if you did. And that's something we need to talk about as to how we address this. And there's lots of ways to put very favorable, positive, mitigating information. I will say the government is very lenient and tolerant of alcohol issues. There's a lot of alcoholics in the U.S. government who have security clearances, quite frankly. Um but they are very, very tolerant of it. So as long as you are making a good effort, you're going to AA, maybe you abstain, whatever it might be. Um, and you can, look, drinking alcohol is not an issue. You can go ahead go ahead and drink and drive for all I care. Just do it legally. 
right? There's a legal limit. So you, we are allowed to drink and drive, have a beer at dinner, a wine, two glasses. You have to know yourself as to where that limit will be and understand as to what your blood alcohol content might be, even though you don't feel it. So you, you got to just be really careful about uh, all of that. Uh, section 25 is about background investigations. Have you ever been investigated and or granted? Because maybe you didn't finish the background investigation. Maybe there wasn't enough time because you were in, it was an internship for school. You still put this all down. Now, there's a lot of I don't know in estimates in this because a lot of times we have no idea what the ultimate result was. Sometimes you don't even know what agency you were put in for, especially as a contractor, because you're not allowed to be told what it was. That's fine. Uh, you just have to figure it out. And, and uh, again, I, I will always say, because this is the key answer to many clearance questions, it depends. Uh, by the way, a Q clearance is the energy department equivalent of a TS, and L is the equivalent of a secret. So if you saw the film Oppenheimer, he had a Q clearance until he didn't have a Q clearance when he lost it, and then got it back just last year posthumously. Uh, ever had a clearance denied, suspended, or revoked? Again, suspended uh, still has to be revealed. And again, this is where lots of mitigating information you want to put into the system. Section 26 is all about financial information. The key thing I would tell you for this, one, most of us are never going to file for bankruptcy. Sometimes bankruptcy is the prudent financial decision to make, not necessarily if you have a clearance. So the bankruptcy lawyer is not going to know that. So that is something, if you do have a clearance, you need to talk to a clearance expert before you, you follow the advice of your bankruptcy lawyer expert. The key thing about financial is I would tell you, always pull your credit report, the full report, every at least every year. The government, you will sign a waiver to let the government pull your credit report. In fact, there is something now that's called continuous evaluation, the computer system is constantly now revolving door checking your credit report. So if something pops up on that, you might not even know it. And it might, in fact, be inaccurate. And the government, because there isn't still a Cold War mentality, which is why this gambling one is still on there, even though I've never, I don't know if I've ever seen a gambling case. Um, they're still thinking if you have a gambling problem or a financial problem, you're going to spy. And historically, because that was the case. So the littlest debt will be an issue. I had an investigator hassle me about a $60 Verizon bill dispute that I had. And I'm like, are you really you really serious? This is what you're going to fight me on? Uh, I've, I mean, not that they cared, but they were kept to, nope, my, my boss said, I need to ask you about why you have this. I'm like, okay, fine. Here you go. This is why. And by the way, I, now I just paid it just to get rid of all of you people. Uh, failure to pay taxes. Wow, this happens a lot. Uh, or to file, not just pay. Make sure you file. By the way, tax period's coming up, right? Next month. Uh, we are required to not only file, but pay by the certain date. You, If you get an extension, that's on filing, not on paying. So make sure for one thing you file for the extension, which you can you'll always get automatically, but you really need to do it. And the government will check on this. And that's obviously easy for them to check because it's the government. Uh, so I'm going to skip. 27 is dealing with uh, technology. Not as much an issue as we used to see it, especially 20 years ago when the Internet really first started and we had to deal with Napster and other uh, technological abilities to download music and movies illegally in violation of copyright law. Um, now it's so easy just to get everything streaming and for and you're paying so little, it doesn't matter. But uh, if you try and access someone's system, if you gave your password away at work or took someone's passport, all possible problems. Did you take information home you shouldn't have? All possible problems. Uh, very fact specific as well. Section 28, and we are finishing up here. There's only one more section. Last 10 years, are you in a court action, civil or elsewise, not listed? So my divorce is listed in section 18, 17. Um, 
or no, let me think. The notion of my divorce is in 17. The existence of it, the details are in 18 or in 28 here. Uh, have you been sued? Have you not been sued? Um, and I've had so many people forget to put lawsuits down on this. Uh, I have to keep track. I sue stuff all the time as a lawyer. Sometimes I'm the actual plaintiff. So I got to keep reminding myself which cases I'm a plaintiff in uh, for FOIA cases in particular. Final section, association. I used to just make fun of this section. And this correlates to guideline A in the guidelines I sent you. I used to make fun of this because some of these questions just seem stupid. Uh, you know, for one thing, how often do we see someone who was a member of terrorist activity or a white supremacist group or something then try and get a clearance? It happens. Uh, but it was more along the lines of, have you ever knowingly engaged in an act of terrorism? And I would go, no, but I inadvertently engaged in an act. Of I mean, really? How do you do that? So I, I would make fun of it until January 6th. Have you ever advocated any acts of terrorism or activities designed to overthrow the government by force? And if you look at guideline A, guideline A talks about, do you support anyone who did any of these activities? So without getting into deep politics, if you believe the January 6 individuals who are in prison committed criminal acts and should be there, you could say no. If you believe they are a hostage, as some have claimed, and believe what they were doing, they had a right to do, this is a yes. And this could be a problem, obviously, for you. Uh, haven't seen cases come up with this yet. Uh, and the government is trying to figure out how are we going to deal with that type of situation. But you can imagine, you can see how it's a situation. Uh, I actually have to answer yes to a couple of these questions because I have, not because I ever engaged in activities, but have I ever associated with anyone involved in activities to further terrorism? Yeah, I have represented some former Al Qaeda members who became uh, assets for the U.S. government intelligence apparatus. And I actually have to put them down on the form. Hasn't prevented me from getting a security clearance. Uh, the final thing here, continuation form, you can add as many pages as you want to this form. You just put your social security number and name at the top and add. There is no limit as to what you want to put. And you put the number of the question and such and do it sequentially. Uh, the other forms at the bottom are just waivers. So you do a waiver for your tax stuff, your, your health information. This, again, they don't get your file. The doctor only answers these questions. Do you have a condition that could impair? All right, let's say you're bipolar. Yes. Describe the condition. The doctor would. Prognosis. Excellent. No concerns. Boom, you're fine. Um, and this is your credit report, et cetera. So that is your SF-86. You are well on the way to getting a security clearance. Uh, it is a complicated, at least frustrating process. I will also say it could take months, sometimes years for this process to complete, depending on what job you're going for. So if you're six months in and you're still like, what's going on? That's normal. And the backlog can change from agency to agency. So don't get a, don't get concerned if it's taking a, a long time uh, for that. Uh, with that, does anyone have any final questions as we close out? I will say, like I said, do not hesitate to reach out to me if you have something more specific, if you have an issue that you want me to help with. Um, I'm always helpful to give some time for free to Hopkins students, given my affiliation for sure. If it's something more complicated, you know, you've been denied a clearance, then we'll work out an attorney-client relationship. But I, I'm definitely happy to give you advice, uh, whether it's today, tomorrow, or you contact me two years from now. Hey, Mark, uh, I saw I sat for this, or I watched you on the video. You know, do, do you mind giving me some advice? Uh, but with that, uh, Peter, uh, I'll, I'll shoot it back to you. Mark, thank you so much. This has uh, been really fantastic. Again, uh, today's event is recorded. 
and we'll be getting this up to the uh, AAP YouTube channel and have that up hopefully later this afternoon. And again, Mark, thanks so much for your time. Thanks for this overview. And we appreciate everyone joining us today. Have a wonderful rest of your day, everyone. Take care.